You know, the, the title to this one is <laughs> uh, Perfect. Uh, is that maybe the best way of saying it? Uh, Antebellum Woke. So uh, if you're seeing the video of this, I really have no idea how I look. Uh, it's, I know how I feel, uh, but I'm not exactly sure how I look. It's actually uh, Hudson and I are in, in the chapel uh, by ourselves, uh, and there's reasons for that. I have uh, COVID, oh boy, I don't even like saying it. I'm um, on my eighth day, I've had uh, a really good run with this thing. Uh, it's the first time I've had it in two years, and I can't say that it's been that pleasant, uh, but it's interesting, its impact over the last three days is I haven't been able to sleep at nights. And so I feel inordinately mentally cloudy. And so Leslie was like, you are not going over and doing your daily thunder today. And I go, eh, you know what? Uh, this is what I do. Uh, and I think it, you know, how could you not come up with a better title than Antebellum Woke when you have been woke for three straight days? I know it's, it's sort of a, a bad English there, but that's what the term woke uh, is. It's bad English. Uh, and so uh, it's been a unique stretch for me in so many regards, and some of you are familiar with the fact or know the fact that my father passed away uh, December 26th, the day after Christmas. His favorite day of the year uh, was Christmas, and um, so it, obviously if any of you have lost a, a parent, uh, you, you understand that it's a significant thing, and I was very close with my dad. He had a huge impact on my life. And so you layer that into this season, and you even layer that into my last week, uh, and uh, we had quite the week. I mean, we had a, a septic uh, problem, our, our plumbing backed up, and we had, I, you know, I had COVID, the whole family basically had it. Uh, and, w you know, it's one of those times where you could easily grumble and complain if you were inclined towards that. And of course, humanity is inclined towards that. There's something that God has taught me, and that is, first of all, to leverage these situations, that these are exponential growth opportunities, that they are, there's more uh, available in them as far as grace than any other types of circumstances in life, and they're called trials. And so, I, I'm not one that usually gets sick. I haven't been sick even for two years. Not only have I not gotten COVID, I haven't gotten anything. And so uh, I almost begin to feel like, hey, you know what? I don't get anything. And so this is a unique thing for me to digest and work through, feeling that freshly, that human frailty, that human vulnerability and uh, here, here's what I'm going to say, all in all. I'm wearing a coat right now because it's cold in here, and I, maybe I even prefer it that way. Uh, but So it's, it's a strange uh, daily thunder in every regard. So Eric Ludy's weaker than you typically would be. He's wearing a coat, uh, and uh, there's no one even in here except for Hudson. <laughs> and yet, I'm very happy. And uh, when, when you're not sleeping, it's, it's, you have a tendency to get extra irritable. I have been making a point to rejoice every time I even have the thought. You know, when, when you get that bait to grumble and, and moan and complain, to rejoice. And so all throughout the night as I've been walking, I, I've walked in the last two days, I think it's like 37 miles. Uh, I've walked just in looping around my kitchen and my living room in the middle of the night and throughout the day because I've, I've just had, uh, I've been uneasy, like I've had some kind of cortisol flare-up in my life, which has just it disabled my, uh, my mind from being able to shut down and go to sleep. And so it's been, what a unique season. But talk about prayer. What opportunity. And I keep ref reference. There's this one quote that I keep saying over and over again, and that is that laughter works good like a medicine. Of course, another way of saying it is a merry heart works uh, like a medicine, or a joyful heart works like a medicine. And so that's what I've been applying as my chief. Now I'm doing other things, but uh, as my chief way of addressing this and the other circumstances in my life is just like, I am going to laugh. I've done a lot of good laughing in the last few days, I've done a, good, a lot of great rejoicing. And so uh, I've been, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word, woke uh, over the past three, three days, not the way that the culture would understand it, which is what I'm going to go into today, because it is amazing. Here we've been going through this series on uh, spiritual lessons from Abe Lincoln's America, and 
you know, we, we understand what our, what's going on in our culture, at least to some degree today, this cancel culture movement, the woke movement, and we're like, what is wrong uh, here? But it's so fascinating to realize that antebellum America, right before the Civil War, they had some similarities. So let's just dive into that real quick. And uh, this isn't even that long of a message. I'll probably spend more time just uh, getting to the message as I'm going to have during the message. Part three, antebellum woke. Oh boy, after all that time. See, I can blame it on the fact that I haven't slept. I don't have my clicker on. Uh, let's define woke. Aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues, especially issues of racial and social justice. So this is like an official uh, definition in, from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. They added the term in 2017. And so the term was originally uh, being crafted to enunciate a, an extra sensitivity amongst the black community in regards to racial issues. And it is spread beyond that. And it has gone uh, a, lot, a lot further than that. But that's sort of the most basic uh, sense. Uh, but here's Fox News. They, they have a, this is like a definition uh, of sorts. The meaning of woke evolved again with the rise of cancel culture. As the two terms saw increased use, they became intertwined in the public consciousness. Often someone gets canceled after they say something insensitive, something not woke. So in addition to meaning aware and progressive, many people now interpret woke to be a way to describe people who would rather silence their critics than listen to them. Now, it's very easy if you're not woke, like no one has ever accused me of being woke until the last three days, right? Uh, but I, I'm not sort of the classic picture. I care deeply about uh, people of every race being uh, loved and cared for and treated as, as equals, and so I have no, there's no diminishment of that, but I wouldn't fall into the classic picture of cancel culture at all. And uh, that last line is very interesting, uh, that they would rather silence their critics than listen to them. Now, we could cluck our tongue uh, over the fence and go, can you believe they're doing that? But that is the same thing that my side, if you could give me a side, uh, conservative Christianity has a tendency to do as well, is to cluck our tongues and want our critics to be silenced as opposed to listening to them. And that's part of uh, what this is about, this particular message, is to recognize that there's a huge similarity in antebellum America and where we're at today. And of course, back then, it led to a civil war. It led to 750,000 men dying because of their inability to communicate. So a culture seriously deficient in one very particular skill, we'll call it listening. Listening is a skill. It is not just something that when you pop out of your mother's womb, you're good at it. You have to cultivate it. And that's one thing. If you could just take one thing out of this message right now, it's, Lord, teach me to listen. Have you ever been uh, in a conversation where the whole while you're, you're talking to someone, you're thinking about what you're going to say as opposed to listening to what they're saying? That's a problem. You see, yes, it does matter that you know what you're going to say because healthy conversation involves both, but healthy conversation starts with good listening. And so if you're a bad listener but a good talker, that isn't uh, a good communicator. Uh, a good communicator is an excellent listener. Even if, uh, if I'm in, like, it just, this happens to be a very unusual situation. I'm in an empty chapel, right? Uh, however, even, let's say we have a, a full chapel and I have, you know, uh, a big audience out here. I still am listening even when I'm speaking. I'm actually engaged with an audience and I have a certain dimension of my psyche that is open and wanting to hear impact. I'm watching body movement, I'm watching responses, all of those things. So even when you're talking, you're listening. But you are first a listener if you wanna be a great communicator, then you are a talker. But we are a culture seriously deficient in listening skill. So here's uh, a great way of putting it. Labels, stereotypes, and hasty presumptions. And then I have a subtitle under this one. Oh, you're one of those. I don't know if you've ever had that said to you, oh, you're one of those. I don't know, it, it doesn't feel good. Uh, there's something about that statement that makes you feel, you know, about this big. And I still remember I was at a Starbucks, one of those community tables uh, in Loveland, and this lady came up and was sitting, I mean, there's a long table there, but she sort of sat herself right across the table from me, and she had her computer, and she kept 
mumbling at it, like, ah, oof, mm. And so finally I said, is everything all right? And she was just waiting for that. And so then she just started talking to me. And uh, then she asked me one question. I don't remember what it was, and I, I made a comment. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I stepped into the manure pile. She goes, oh, you're one of those. Well, what was one of those to her? Well, I was one of those guys who was like a Christian who was, you know, all conservative and, you know, had backwards values, you know, that were so dated. And she didn't mind telling me that. And she spent a good deal of my day, just sort of ate it up, and telling me how ridiculous I was. You know, there's nothing that fun about that, but it was interesting because I remember thinking, you know, I, I don't think I actually fit the grid that you think I fit, but you're not able to actually hear me to even listen to have me inform you otherwise. Once you get labeled, oh, you're, it's over, it's over. And so that's one of the things I want us to recognize is it's not just the liberals that label the conservatives. It happens within Christianity too, within denominations. It's like, oh, you're, you're one of those. And once you're one of those, suddenly you're not listened to anymore. And so when the charismatic runs into the Baptist or the Baptist runs into the charismatic, you have that clash. And as a result, you have the one of those type of comment. And you can cut people off. Even within the church, this happens. Not healthy. There was a real problem in 1861. Slavery wasn't just in someone's imagination. It was a very real issue in the United States of America. See, a lot of people, when uh, we've walked through some of the woke issues and uh, some of the uh, dramatic Black Lives Matter events that have taken place in the past uh, couple years, you know, we, I, I've heard it said multiple times, like, there isn't even an issue, and they're making an issue. And in a strange way, that's not altogether dissimilar from what was happening back then. However, I think it was, it's a little easier in hindsight to see the real issue that was taking place with slavery back then. Of course, some of us now, you can get sort of the vibe on the conservative side. It's like, boy, they're making an issue. People are set free. There's no more slavery. But there still is a sense of racial inequality to these people. And as long as there's that sense, it's real. And it needs to be addressed and there needs to be a listening ear. And that's part of the challenge I think we're facing. The approach is everything. Now, look at, I put a couple different options up under the screen. Violence and hatred versus peace and love. Now, if I were to say which one is best, well, of course, it's pretty obvious which one is best, peace and love, yeah, yeah. However, there's even a few of us that would know the biblical framework, but sometimes, you know, like in the Civil War, when you're thinking about the North and the fact that they're going to beat up on the South and they're going to take out slavery because they won the Civil War, we're like, yeah, go for it. However, that's not God's agenda is to bring about civil war. His goal is not violence and hatred. He has a different plan. One of, I, I actually am very intrigued by Martin Luther King Jr. because he took the same burden, the, the woke burden, if you want to say it that way, and he approached it with such a different attitude where he prohibited his followers from being violent. And they were peaceful. They were marked by love and care for others. That is a very, very interesting way to change the world. Yes, that's Jesus' way of changing the world. So you can actually be wide awake, but you need to make sure you're wide awake to live the right way with peace and love, not violence and hatred. So let me introduce you to the Bahoys. Uh, are, that's short for Bowery Boys of 1861. These were working class men that loved to brawl and were in competition with other Bahoy companies to put out fires in the city. Their hair was cut short in the back and left long and waxed in the front. They were called soap locks. They wore colorful shirts and stovepipe hats. That's, like, that's what Lincoln had. He wore a stovepipe hat. So these guys wore a stovepipe hat as well. They were often unruly but good-hearted. They were loyal to their friends and to their gahal. That's G-H-A-L. They were typically uneducated but self-taught in higher culture. Now what's interesting about this is it just happens to be the description of Abraham Lincoln. So in a strange way, Abraham Lincoln was a Bahoy, but we don't think of him that way. It was a certain type of, uh, of character back then. 
So uh, I think I have a picture. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so there's a Bohoy and his Gahal. Uh, and so you see his stovepipe hat and his uh, soap locks in the front and how he wears his pants. The, uh, I don't even know how to describe that. But uh, that's, a, that's a pretty cool picture. So this was a common thing. And these guys love to get in fights and to wrestle and to put out fires. They sort of like danger. They, was look, they were looking for an adventure. These characters are going to become very, very important in this era. Now, what I want to put my finger on is there are certain men out there right now. Okay, now, I, I don't know if this is how I would typically think of describing myself. Because I'm not just looking for a fight, but in a strange way, I'm looking for my battle. And so, you know, in a real way, I may be a Bahoy in my generation, just like you may be, where we don't want to just sit around and watch the world just fall to pieces. We want to engage in that world. We want to do something about what is taking place. However, most people do it wrong. So those that are wired like I am or like you are, they have a tendency to approach it in a self-centered way. They don't listen. They just come in and start clobbering people, okay? And so Lincoln is going to actually make an appeal to the Bahoy of his generation. And he's going to basically recruit this group, and they're going to be his biggest supporters. And, you know, at the time, you know, before Lincoln actually rose uh, into a position of prominence, the Bahoy were actually supporters of slavery. They weren't even against it. They were, it's not that they were for it, they just weren't against it. They, they didn't see it as a, an issue worthy of their time. And of course, most of them uh, were not African American, so, they, you know, they, and they were from the North, but they, they weren't abolitionists. They, they were just looking for a fight, they were looking for a purpose. So young America is what it was called back then. And this is the description of it. It was ready to fight for something. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to fight for the right thing, but it was ready to fight for something. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if that's a perfect fit. It could be, though, for where our culture is at right now. See, our culture isn't very well educated right now. We're not doing very well in so many of the markers uh, that make a successful culture. But it is interesting if you were to say, are we willing to fight for something? Well, could be. Could be that we're similar in that regard. So listen to George Foster, who was a journalist in 1850. The Bahoy of the Bowery, that's the Bahoys that I was just describing, the Rowdy of Philadelphia, the Hoosier of the Mississippi, and the Trapper of the Rocky Mountains, and the Gold Hunter of California are so much alike that an unexpected hand could not distinguish one from the other. In other words, just because you're from Philly or New York or from Colorado doesn't mean that you can't be of the same ilk, even though you might dress a little different. The Bahoy had a very specific kind of dress, the soap locks and the hat. But the, the trapper in Colorado is very different. And so, but they all were of the same ilk. They were young America. They were ready for a fight. So the Bahoys switched sides. You know, the Bahoys are going to switch sides. They're actually supporting a guy named Stephen Douglas at the time, and I haven't really talked much about him in this series, but he was sort of the arch nemesis of, of Lincoln, and he had just beat Lincoln in a senatorial race before the presidential election, and they're both from the same state. And uh, Stephen Douglas was a, I don't know if this is a fair way of describing him, a rabid uh, racist. <laughs> The man was unhealthy. I don't know how else to say it. I would not want to identify with him. And the Bahoy loved this guy because Douglas was a fighter. He just was always picking a fight. He was always, you know, cursing and using foul language and uh, always drinking. And he was just sort of a rough and tumble guy. And the Bahoy, you see, they were malleable and they liked his manliness. But his manliness was a distorted version of one. And so, guess who else shows up? Lincoln. Lincoln comes strolling onto the public stage, and he has different values. He thinks different than Douglas, but he's rough and tumble. And this guy, he was a wrestler. Did you know Lincoln was a wrestler? And he had Marfan syndrome, which means he had extra long arms. He was a very tall guy, and he had extra long arms and legs. And so, just sort of disproportionate, but it made him a great wrestler. 
And so he was a rough and tumble character. He's like a Bohoy, right? And so the Bohoy begin to watch him, but something else is happening at this time, and there's a book that is released, and it's called Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And that turned into a musical. I want to say a musical. It might have been just a play uh, that was, you know, in the, in the theaters at the time. And the Bahoy were trying to be cultured. That was one of the things about the Bahoy is they always wanted to go see the latest plays and musicals and things like that. And so they went to Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is one of the most strange phenomenons of culture. But that this entire group of Bahoy are going to switch sides on the issue. And they're going to dump Douglas and start adopting Lincoln. One of the reasons Lincoln's going to get elected is because the Bahoy are going to swing behind him and catch a vision of something worth fighting for. That the slaves should not be treated this way. That the African-American should not be treated this way. In a strange way, <laughs> they're going to wake up. So David Reynolds, uh, the historian, says, after making an anti-slavery speech March 3rd, 1860, he, uh, Lincoln, entered a carriage. Quickly, the vehicle was surrounded by scores of young men who spontaneously arranged themselves in military order. They escorted the carriage to the hotel. Lincoln remarked to the mayor, the boys are wide awake. Suppose we call them wide awakes. Now, am I the only one that finds that totally extraordinary, that right before the Civil War, we had a group of people called the Wide Awakes, and right now we have the woke crowd. I mean, that is, that is remarkable. So David Reynolds continues, when Lincoln momentously won the presidential nomination in May of 1860, inquiries poured into Connecticut from all over the North about the procedures of the Wide Awakes. The name had gotten out, and soon a pro-Lincoln Wide Awakes club formed all over the place. Mass demonstrations by the Wide Awakes became a defining feature of the campaign to elect Lincoln. And so it's interesting because just like the woke community now, its foundational cause was originally racial injustice. Now it's spread to all forms of social injustice and all sorts of cancel culture things as well. However, that was its root issue, just like the Wide Awakes root issue actually was the same. It was anti-slavery. And so it's just fascinating to see that. But uh, here's the other thing I want to put my finger on. The behavior of the Wide Awakes under Lincoln is very different than the woke crowd today. The woke crowd today can't hear you talk. They just immediately want to cancel you and nullify you if you say the thing that they don't want you to say. It's a very unhealthy way of functioning in any system. And so you may be wide awake, but you sure are sleepy on that point. And so it's very, very important that you handle things different. Douglas versus Lincoln. The differences were more than ideological. So Douglas and Lincoln are about as far removed from each other as you could get. And I, like I said earlier, I'm not a Douglas fan. I, and I, I do like Lincoln, even though you'd think that I'm the biggest Lincoln fan just because I'm doing a series uh, that brings up his name. Uh, you know, I didn't support every single thing uh, that, that he did, but, you know, I like him in a general sense. And so I would definitely vote for Lincoln in this uh, matchup. Uh, so listen to this. John Hay, who is a lawyer in 1860, is going to give this observation. He is going to witness the wide awakes at a Lincoln rally. He's going to say, at Lincoln's rally, there was none of that rowdy plebeianism which outcrops in all Douglas crowds. No pandering to the vile groundswell of ruffian passions, no barefooted rangers, no hangings in effigy, and none of the yelling diabolism that spiced the Douglas turnout of July. The whole affair came off with intense decency and tremendous cohesion. So I think it's interesting just to see that the woke crowd today is very similar to the Douglas crowd back then. It lacks the honor. It lacks the dignity. It is very violent and very anti anyone who doesn't seem to uh, throw its hat in with it. Whereas this crowd is supposedly wide awake and they're seeing something, but they have order to that. And that's one of the things I really like uh, here. And it's, of course, just a quality that Lincoln is bringing is a sense of order and decency to, what, to fighting the battles that he's going to fight. The most admirable, admirable order was preserved at the Lincoln Rally with the Wide Awakes marching in a very gentlemanly manner and dispersing in a becoming 
way. That's from the Illinois State Journal in 1860. What a great description. So actually, I, you know, I'm going through and I'm giving different secrets uh, from Lincoln and his leadership. And the one I want to draw on today is what I'm going to call never ever send the first draft. You see, when you lack listening skills, you have a tendency to react as opposed to process. Because processing is part of that listening. You're hearing, you're heeding, you're absorbing, and then you're processing. But if, have you, you ever received an email and it just ticks you off? It makes you so mad? One of my life principles, and, I, and I've, I think I've spoken on this multiple times in the past in various ways when I'm going through life lessons or various things, and it's this, never ever send the first draft. I know it's profound, isn't it? But when you send a first draft of, a, of an email or a letter, you have a tendency to say things you shouldn't say. And so that's why a life principle is never ever send the first draft. Almost every key correspondence I send, if not every key correspondence I send, is going to be reviewed and, and read by at least one other person, you know, like Leslie. But some of it, it's my entire staff that will read it, and I want their feedback. Give me perspective. And even before I send it to them, it's not going to be the first draft, especially if it's a very delicate matter, especially it's one that if my emotions could be involved in it, I need to make sure that those are in check and they are not speaking. My emotions aren't what should speak, and so though I may have them, they're not in control. And so until I'm able to write something or communicate something without emotion blaring, then I'm not going to send it. I'm not going to write it. Or I'm, I will write it. I'm not going to release it and communicate it. So never, ever send the first draft. That'll save you a lot of headaches in life, and it'll, it'll spare a lot of relational damage. So Proverbs 29, 11 talks about this. It says, a fool vents all his feelings. A fool sends his first draft but a wise man holds them back. Proverbs 12, 16. A fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. You see, the fool sends the first draft is basically the concept. In other words, don't do that. In life, there are so many situations where there's draft one and there could be a draft two, but you need to restrain yourself by immediately responding. It says a fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. Amos 5.13, very interesting scripture. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time. Why? For it is an evil time. You see, in the midst of an evil time, it is important that you don't just vent. And right now, we are in the midst of an evil time. And it's very easy to speak things and to declare things too haphazardly, to send your first draft, your first assessment of what you see. There are things that don't, you know, resonate with my soul. They don't. However, to not just vent my feelings or to express my thoughts quickly, but to restrain in that. You know, throughout this entire uh, last couple years, I have had a lot of thoughts. Don't get me wrong. However, if you were to look at all of my communications, there's a lot of different sub-conversations and sub-thinking processes and study in Scripture to say, God, how am I supposed to respond to this? How am I supposed to deal with this? I, yeah, I do not like what has happened in our culture. I do not like what that person is saying over there. I do not like what has happened in the church over here. However, Lord, govern me. Take this tongue and harness it. I want to speak in such a way that brings life and doesn't just undermine my potential relationship with other people because I mishandle my tongue. I do not want to be a fool that vents himself to his shame. Okay, guys, I love this quote. This is a great illustration of not sending the first draft. David Reynolds uh, shares this story. During the Civil War, when he, Lincoln, heard that a cabinet member, Ed, Edwin Stanton, in an angry moment cried, we've got to get rid of that baboon at the White House. Lincoln was asked how he could endure such an insult. Insult? Insult, the president said. That is no insult. It is an expression of opinion. And what troubles me most about it is that Stanton said it, and Stanton is usually right. You see, that wouldn't have been his first response because he's a human. His first response is to be insulted, is to be offended. However, Lincoln was a very, very wise man. And so what he is going to do is he's going to take this, this 
it is an insult, by the way, right? But he is going to take this and he's going to convert it into an opportunity for everyone to laugh and to actually, in a strange sense, you have more admiration for Abraham Lincoln because he doesn't send his first draft and just say, hey, you take that back. You know, that's a violation of my honor. Instead of doing that, we actually appreciate the man all the more. What is that quality? Well, self-restraint, governing the tongue, is of the utmost importance in an evil time. Do not let your words fly quickly. Right now, the woke crowd is allowing their words to, to fly quickly. And I'm, I have a hunch that history will hold them uh, <laughs> to a higher standard than the current culture and the media is holding them to. Because it's not true. So many things that are being let fly are not true. And they are exaggerations. They're straw man arguments. And as a result, it is an unhealthy form of communication that's creating even a deeper divide. But let's not participate in it. Let's not be participants in the battles of sending first drafts, but let's never ever send a first draft. So let's go review the leadership secrets of Lincoln that we have so far. So in the first message, we had draw loving lines, not hard lines. The second message, we had approach the nasty stuff like a Quaker. And then number three, today's, never ever send the first draft. Father, I ask that you would build us for this hour, that we would not speak things lightly and that we would not allow words to flow out of our mouth that are not first considered and prayerfully measured. Lord, I ask that you would build us for the hour in which we live and that we could be wide awake in the most appropriate sense. Lord, we trust you. You are good and faithful and true. Amen.